Oh, kia ora whanau. You know, over these last few weeks, we've been in this process of forming a, a manifesto to bring renewal to the people and places of our city. And, and I think God is, is opening our eyes in a way for us to see what God sees and to expand our heart to feel what it is that He feels. And, and we, we hear that call of God upon us as a community of faith as a minority exiled community to work for the peace and prosperity of the city where God has placed us, for the shalom of our city. So over these last few weeks, as we've come to this group of books called the Minor Prophets, not because they're unimportant, but because they're small, we've already heard four of those aspects that form our manifesto. There might be a quiz at the end of our series, just... A deep love for God, committed to the lost, welcoming of difference, concerned for the poor. As a pastor, I've found that as people start to get their hands messy in mission, you know, when, when you actually step out and you start to, you know, get engaged and and a concern for the poor and working for the peace and prosperity of the city, that there's a point where many people kind of hit a wall. You hear God's concern for the poor, so you go and, and start making meals for the homeless. And, and at first you begin to feel the thrill of, of being used by God. But after a few months, you begin to realize just how messy and widespread it all is. And you realize a solution needs to involve more than passing out some meals. And it's complex and it's difficult. And, and it's at that very point where you can just kind of throw up your hands in despair and go, oh, I just give up on the whole thing. It's too hard. Or, or you begin helping a friend through abuse that she endured when she was just six years old. Growing up, you know, felt like, you know, looked like she was immune to the injustice that was done to her. Because she got married, she had a baby, but after the birth of her second child, somehow in the, the joy of the, the birth, when, you know, all those mechanics are going, you know, pinging the, the human body and, and the horm hormones are being released that, you know, trigger all these things in our brain, suddenly, suddenly the memories of the past surface. <laughs> Memories that she had been able to repress for some decades. Now she's in therapy. She's been in therapy for the past 10 months. And she's not the same anymore. And, and you try to help her, but there is this barrage of questions about God. At first you can kind of handle it, but, but over time, those questions give birth to your own set of questions. Is God fear? Does God care? Is God even there? And it's not just the grown-ups who, who ask these questions. It might be that you're, you're trying to help this struggling marriage and then it implodes. And the kids are trying to make sense of it all. You know, I prayed that daddy wouldn't leave us. I prayed every night, so hard. But he did. Here behind those, those comments, the same questions? Does God fear? Does God care? Is God even there? And as a pastor observing the kind of trend that happens with us over the years, I can almost plot the journey on an S curve. It kind of begins like this, you know, at the very bottom, somebody comes to know Jesus and, and there's a lot of joy and a lot of thrill and, and that newfound adventure and, and, and the freedom that we sung about this morning. And, and uh, they keep growing and, and then you found faith. They reach this high point where everything seems to be going well. You know, the songs are exciting. You, you read the Bible and the words kind of like, like jump off the page at you and, and mean something to you. Relationships around you are blooming. You know, you, you pray to God about a need you have. You know, you wanna have a baby and you pray and you just seem to get pregnant. Or your kids are at school and having some difficulty and you pray and it just works out difficulty. Everything's going well and, and you reach this high point. But, but then you hit this, this major difficulty in your life. Number three, 
you start to head down. It might be this personal struggle. You, you know, were made redundant at work through this dodgy process. And months and months still have gone by and you're still looking for work. Your spouse just leaves you stranded. An illness arises that just doesn't go away. Someone you looked up to as someone who loved and served God disappoints you through the foolish choices they made and the downward trajectory they went on. Or you encounter layer after layer of injustice in the city and the hurdle after hurdle after hurdle to try to do something about it. And, and at first, you can survive it all. You, you, you pray, God, we've been through some bumps before and you've come through for me every single time. But this time when, when you pray, it, it seems like you, you slide further down. Nothing seems to make sense. You open the Bible and, and the, the words don't jump out at you anymore. They just seem to be words. And, and, and you pray but it just feels like you're talking to yourself. And it doesn't take long as, as doubt begins to rise and as those questions are heard on your own lips. Is God fear? Does God care? Is He even there? And so today we come to the most brutally honest book, I think, in the Bible about how to live in difficult times how to trust in difficult times. It's just three chapters long, but this book of Habakkuk, among these minor prophets, is kind of unique because he doesn't preach to the people. Rather, the whole three chapters is this, is this dialogue that he has with God. In fact, the dialogue is, is probably too much of a vanilla word because it's more of this debate, this serious, listen to these serious complaints he brings to God. How long, O oh Lord, must I call for help? But you will not listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed. And there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous, so the justice has become perverted. I mean, look here at what Habakkuk sees around the city. Violence, evil, misery, destruction, arguing and fighting, perversion of justice. These are difficult times. And Habakkuk knows what ought to be. Because the Hebrew law, the Old Testament that he had at the time was, was very clear about the need for God's people to protect the most vulnerable in society. God knew that once they had been, you know, they'd been uh, slaves in Egypt and God had rescued them and brought them into their own land. And, and he wanted to ensure that the same heart that he had for them would be a heart for all peoples, all peoples who were vulnerable and in need. But all these rules in place, the, these laws to help remind them of what should be, you know, and, and how to treat the kid without a mum and dad, a woman who had no support around them, or refugees with little rights. But in Habakkuk's day, people seem to just turn a blind eye to, to God's laws, and the vulnerable in society were being neglected, and, and not just neglected, but they were being preyed upon by leaders and by people who would, you know, just take advantage of them. Just all this injustice in the city. In fact, it got so bad in the time of, um, you know, Habakkuk, we read in Second Kings, one of the kings of that time was called Manasseh. This is the epitome of injustice. Manasseh also murdered many innocent people until Jerusalem was filled from one end to the other with innocent blood. I mean, horrid image. See, Habakkuk knows what ought to be, but he looks out and he, and he sees the opposite. And, and he can't work out why God seems to just have his you know, hands in his pockets, doing nothing about it. And he's hit, a, he's hit that dip on the S-curve. He's trying to make sense of it all. And all of it causes this disruption in his own spirit. Tell me you haven't had those same feelings. Because if you love and you fear God, then you will feel the same way at times that Habakkuk did. 
You know, you read the news on your phone app and, and you hear the stories of injustice and something in your very heart cries out, how long, O oh Lord? You tell me about the moment you got fired from your job or a romance that had sparked so, so beautifully at first then exploded right before your eyes or the time you sat in your car after that dreaded doctor's appointment or the times you still sit on your couch all by yourself because your spouse walked out on you. Tell me you haven't had those moments when you have begged God for relief. God, where are you? How can you let these things happen to me? Well, the prophets were kind of broader-minded that the most of us, and, and they didn't just think about themselves, they, they thought about the needs of the people around them, so the questions for them were, God, how can you let these things happen to these people? I want you to notice how bold and honest Habakkuk is as he comes to God. How long, O oh Lord, must I call out for help? Strong words. Theologians call them a, a lament, where we bring these anxieties and frustrations and confusions to God without holding anything back. It's interesting, isn't it? You know, when you think about the fact that these are in the Bible, God's word, which you remind us that God's actually okay with tough questions. That rather than running from God with our questions, we can actually bring the, the raw, as most honest, difficult questions to God. God, why do the wicked not get what's coming to them? Why is it that the righteous seem to suffer? The world has gone mad. God, why aren't you doing something about it now? God, why do I not attract the attention of a potential spouse? But why is it that sleazy seems to get attention while wholesome and good gets nothing? Why did that experienced 59-year-old who worked so faithfully lose his job to an inexperienced 21-year-old? Why can't I have children while others who don't even seem to want children or treasure the children they have just seem to fall pregnant? How can leaders make decisions that are just so unfair to others? God it's not fair. But amidst our questions, a beautiful thing about Habakkuk is that he, he shows us that God can handle all our questions, but he will answer just a few of them. And, and this, you know, this can be woefully unsatisfying for us to grasp, but there's a reason for it that we see in Habakkuk. Amidst Habakkuk's complaint, God tells Habakkuk that, you know, you're not gonna get the whole answer. And, and even if I could tell you the whole answer, it wouldn't even be satisfying for you. In fact, he says, God, God says, for I'm doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe, even if someone told you about it. You hear God's answer there to him? You wouldn't believe it even if I told you the whole story. It's just not something you can actually grasp. Let me illustrate it. Picture yourself in a car. Mum's driving, and the back is her 16-month-old who was overdue for a nap. And she senses that there will be a meltdown at any moment if this kid doesn't get home for a nap. Next to the 16-month-old is a three-year-old, a five-year-old, and a seven-year-old. I'm sure these ages are simply coincidental to my children's ages at the time. <laughs> the seven-year-old clutches her bag with her swimming tox. After all, mom had told her that very morning, if we have time after the shopping and before your auntie comes around, we will or we may be able to go to the swimming pool. It wasn't a promise, but you know how kids are. She just heard the word swimming. And then mom looks through the rear vision mirror and she sees her 16 month old about to lose it. And she breaks the news to the family that swimming isn't gonna happen today. Now the meltdown moves from that 16-month-old to the seven-year-old. And she uses a particular phrase that I'm sure you have never used before or ever heard of before. This isn't fair. Oh, somebody has heard it before. <laughs> and, and if you've um, you know, ever had that kind of infant in the, in the back seat who's overdue for a nap, you know the call that she made. But does a seven-year-old ever understand it? Well, no, 
or, or she sees or she hears a swimming is off and this is so unfair. Just can't grasp the bigger picture, doesn't understand the delicate family equilibrium that needs to take place. So God explains something to Habakkuk, but he also realized, I can't give you the whole thing because you just wouldn't grasp it. You, you don't, you're not able to fully understand what's going on here. But he does say to Habakkuk, you want an answer? You, you want to know when justice is coming? Well, I'm actually going to raise up Babylon. And Babylon's going to come and they're going to bring justice on the people of God. This is huge. But for Habakkuk, it's not the answer that he wants. I, I think he wants an answer with words like revival or something like that in it. He, he wants his difficulties to go away, not to escalate. It's interesting because at this time, uh, Babylon uh, was geographically not even very close to the people of God. Most fights were just kind of between close neighbors. But the fact that we even know Babylon two and a half thousand years ago reminds us that Babylon was this empire and they mowed down nations. See, this answer would be like somebody saying today, praying, God, you know, would you bring justice on, on New Zealand? And, and then God says, oh, yeah, I'm gonna raise up ISIS to come and bring justice on New Zealand. You know, and we would be crying out like Habakkuk then, as he does here. He, he no longer accuses God of being inactive. He now says, God, uh, God, um, are you kidding me? You know, I want a justice, God, but come on. You know, they're worse than we are. How can you give military victory to them over us? How, how can you elevate them? It's a new complaint. So God answers this new complaint in chapter two, and effectively God's answer, you can summarize it as, oh, they're gonna get what's coming to them too. Their plunderers will also be plundered. And sure enough, this is how history plays out. Babylon came along, they led this army to seize the city of Jerusalem in 586 BC. And by siege, it meant that the whole city was uh, in desperate times, you know, starving. Eventually, Nebuchadnezzar was able to go in, uh, destroy their temple, uh, put the city in ruins, smoke is rising, takes the able-bodied men, women, and children a thousand kilometers all the way over to Babylon. It's not pretty. Uh, it's this period we call the exile. But after those 70 years in exile, sure enough, God says, Babylonians will get what's coming to them, and another empire rises up, the Medo-Persian Empire, and Babylonians get what's coming to them. It's kind of a history lesson. But the prophets raise some questions. He's looking at this going, this isn't the answer I wanted. It's not the answer I expected. Now there's gonna be an escalation of difficulty. But as we come to chapter three, it's really interesting because you know, right at the beginning, the, the, the prophet is, is questioning God. He's crying out to God for help. But you come to the very end and he's moved from complaint to calmness and to confidence. Listen to the way the book ends. Beautiful words. I trembled inside when I heard this. My lips quivered with fear. My, my legs gave way beneath me, and I, I shook in terror. I will wait quietly for the coming day when disaster will strike the people who invade us. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms, even though there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crops fail, the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields, and the cattle barns are empty yet, yet, say it with me, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. So let's unpack this a bit. Because Habakkuk is giving this a beautiful poetry, but it's this realistic picture that conveys a complete economic and societal breakdown and meltdown. The fig trees do not blossom. Apparently figs take a long time before they blossom, at least like five years after they're planted to kind of get to that stage. And if everything's gonna be destroyed, it's gonna take years for the city to be rebuilt. See, normally we, we tell people, well, you can trust God, but, and, and we can trust God, and Normally in those circumstances when the fig trees are blossoming, when the circumstances are going well for us. But Habakkuk's saying completely the opposite. Even though there are no grapes on the vine, no olive crops, even though there's no bread, there's no you know, lamb kebabs, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Put it in your own words. Even though there's no money in the bank, no house of my own even though I've been through three job interviews and have not been invited for the fourth one, even though someone I love is in rehab again. 
even though someone I love moves so far away or up and dies on me, even though someone sends that text that dents my reputation, even though uncaring leaders get into these positions of power and turn this blind eye to justice, yet, yet, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Remember, the circumstances haven't changed here. So so what led Habakkuk to move from complaint to confidence? Well, he had a vision of who God is and a vision of God's grand plan. You can read through chapter two a little later. It's this vision of the Holy One coming from Edom, that this one whose glory fills the world and all nature is convulsed before him and the prophet too. That's why Habakkuk says, I trembled inside when I heard this. My lips quivered with fear. My legs gave way beneath me. I shook in terror. It's not Babylon he's seen. He's actually talking about seeing God, this vision of the Lord, and it terrifies him at just how great God is. This is what happened when Isaiah saw the mess in his world, how rotten things were, and and he says, you know, I'm undone. I'm unraveled like this ball of wool. I I need you, God, to put me back together again because I've seen the mess everything's in, including myself. But then Isaiah was able to see things from God's perspective and say, here am I, send me. Let's do something together about this mess, God. Same thing happened to Job. He raises all sorts of questions, legitimate questions about the immense suffering that he endured. You can understand why all of these things are happening to him and his family because he was a righteous, just person. And, and, and Job doesn't give, get any answers to his why questions. Instead, God gives him this, this glimpse of who God is. And when Job sees that, listen to the way he responds. God, you asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? <laughs> it's I, Job. And I, I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. God, you said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. I don't know who heard about you before, but now I see you with my own eyes. And I take back everything I said as I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. You know, Job never gets an answer to his why questions. But what he does get is better still. He gets this glimpse at who God is. It doesn't satisfy the why, but the sense of who God is means that Job is now able to trust in difficult times. See, over the years as a pastor, the people that I see that don't just endure but thrive in difficult times are the people who who see this glimpse of who God is and see the the big plan of God and are able to trust Him. Earlier on in the book, we read a contrast between two groups of people, the proud and the righteous or, or the just. We read, look at the proud, they trust in themselves and their lives are crooked. You know, they trust in their networks they have, that the stuff they've accumulated, you know, they trust in the, the, the way the fig tree is, is blossoming. And he says, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. Hopefully that's you and me. That you see him and you see his grand plan. It's like the person who contacted me yesterday about the, the way the cancer had returned for her husband but still seeing God. You see the lack of blossoms on the fig trees, but you see past the lack of blossoms on the fig tree. You see past the person who abuses power. You see past that nasty text. You instead see a faithful God who has this big plan in the world. See, page after page in the Bible is full of story after story of injustice. You might remember Joseph. Uh, He was sold by his brothers into slavery out of envy, completely unjust. But he he, he does well. He rises into, you know, uh, lead his master's household. But then, you know, his master's wife comes to him wanting to sleep with Joseph. And Joseph's like, no way, you know, I can't do that. It's, It's wrong. And so she gets angry with him and she has him imprisoned again unjustly. And all these different things happen, you know, completely terrible things. And yet Joseph starts to see this big plan of God starting to 
come together. He's not blind to the injustice of his circumstances. But as he looks back, he says this to the very people who sold him into slavery at the beginning. You intended to harm me, you know, and it's wrong what you did. But God intended it for good. He, he brought this position, he brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. I mean, fast forward hundreds of years and you come to the time of Jesus. You know, all the injustice that was done in Jesus' life. You know, he's born to poor parents. He, he's on the run from this, you know, as a political refugee, uh, innocent of any wrongdoing, and yet he gets killed unjustly. And in the midst of the injustice done to him, God is able to bring justice and salvation to everyone in the world. And as the early church leaders look on this, they say in Acts, they actually quote from Habakkuk, this verse we looked at earlier. They say, look, you mockers, be amazed, for I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. There's a much bigger plan going on here, a plan that no one could have ever hatched or designed. No one could ever have seen it coming. It's kind of too grand, but at the time, it looks bleak and dark and miserable. But you see, this is why Jesus could trust in difficult times. This is why Habakkuk trusted in difficult times. This is why you and I can trust in difficult times. But without trusting in difficult times, your, your heart can go in any number of directions, dark directions. Without trusting in difficult times, you might just throw it all in when you, when you hit that dreaded dip. Without trusting in difficult times, you will become numb to the injustice and the brokenness, declaring, what's the point? Without trusting in difficult times, you become bitter and sour. Without trusting in difficult times, you will be without hope. But here at Green Lane Christian Center, we will be people who trust in difficult times. We will stay the course. We will not simply trust when decisions go our own way or when the, the graphs are going up and to the right, when health tests come back in the clear or when attendance goes up or, or when Christians might one day be the majority again. No, no, we will trust in difficult times because God is not blind to injustice. God hears the cries, God sees the wrongdoing and he will bring justice on the guilty. And he will make all things right in our world. He can be trusted. And, and I, I realize that there will be people here today going through a, a horrid times. And you can hear me say, you know, just trust in difficult times. It just sounds so feeble. It was the same for Habakkuk. So, so think about what it meant for him to trust and what it meant for the remnant of faithful people at that time to trust because things were about to get more difficult, not easier. The city was gonna be sieged. They would watch people starve as Babylon came in. They would be marched a thousand kilometers from their home, glancing back at their city, seeing the smoke rise, seeing their temple destroyed, seeing them kind of marched into Babylon, and then told by God to work hard for the peace and prosperity of their city, even when people like Nebuchadnezzar, who caused all this harm, are the ones leading and making decisions. It takes trust to listen to what God says. So what does the word mean for you today? But how will you trust in difficult times when you have invested your very best into your children, but they're not going on spiritually? How will you trust in difficult times when the government makes decisions that might be at odds with what God's way is? How might you trust when you see the cycle of abuse occur again and again, how, how will you trust in difficult times when your work and service seem to produce little or no results? Can I just share three things to finish this talk? A couple of these things have kind of helped me. Another one is kind of, kind of new for me, for, you know, focus of this, this series. And you know these well, but I think we all need to be reminded. The first one is Pray. I feel like I'm growing in my own prayer life these, these past few years, learning just to bring my raw honesty, my raw questions to God. God already knows them anyway. He sees everything going on. But he wants to hear it from me. Don't run from him. Run to him. Talk to him. Be honest about what you're facing. God, this is the space I'm in. I don't like this space. I didn't ask for this space, but I will trust you in this space. Oh, help me to see you right here. 
because I don't want my heart to turn a dark shade of bitter. You know, at the end of every service, we have people up the front available for prayer. It's only like a few of you ever kind of coming forward, you know, but all of us need to, you know, be in that spot. You know, I've come forward for prayer myself at times just because we need people around us to pray. Sometimes it's just not enough for us to kind of voice something to God ourselves. We need others to gather around us. Might be that you're gathering around others to pray even for other people. Take hold of those opportunities, even today. Another thing is worship. You know, worship, it almost seems like this natural thing to do when things are going well. You know, when the fig tree is blossoming, it seems so unnatural when things are tough. Interesting, though, that the Psalms, which is like the ancient book of Israel, their kind of hymn book, majority of those Psalms are what's called the lament Psalms. Psalms where things are not going well for someone, but they're coming and they're worshiping. They're they're saying, God, I will trust you in these difficult times. I find just listening to worship songs really helps provide me with hope when I'm facing difficult times. Uh, This week, I love the song Cherie shared on our Facebook page on this, uh, this past Friday. Filled my soul with hope. Listen to some of these words. I'm not gonna be afraid because these waves are only waves. Let faith rise up, O heart, believe. Let faith rise up, peace, be still. God, you are here, so it is well. Even when my eyes can't see you, I will trust the voice that speaks to me. And my confidence, my my trust in difficult times just kind of rose as I could see God. Prayer, worship. The, The last one comes from anchor text for this series, because to summarize it, it is work, to work for the peace and prosperity of our city. This is the message the prophets have for us as a faith community. You know, when there is so much brokenness, again, it's so easy to throw up our hands, just retreat, move away from it, but again, listen to what the prophet, what God says to us as a community when we are the minority, when we're this exiled group of people. I shared this back on, on Queen's birthday weekend, but a whole bunch of you weren't around. Uh, this is what it says. This is what the Lord of heaven's army says to the captives he's exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes, plan to stay, plant gardens, and eat the food they produce, and work for the peace and prosperity, the shalom of the city where I sent you into exile. You know, stop living as refugees. Make this your home. You know, sure, I get that things are different. You left a place where everyone believed like you do. Now you've come to this very pluralistic place. Back then, if you walked past an idol, you could kind of tear it down. But now you're in this place where you're not the ones who make decisions. You're not the majority. And these are difficult times. But what I want you to do, God says, is work for the peace and prosperity of the city. And yes, I realize Nebuchadnezzar, this king who's horrible, is in charge. But trust in difficult times. Be focused on what I've told you to do. So even when you face the barrage of questions about God, is God fear? Does God care? Is God even there? Even when it looks like the people who promote injustice seem to be the ones who seem to prosper, and those who are the victims of justice seem to get worse and worse and worse in their plight. But pray and worship and work. These are the things we do to trust in difficult times. Some of you here this morning uh, feel like you're slipping. My prayer for you, as I've come to today, is that God would strengthen you, that you realize you are not alone. You never have been, and you never will be. Let me finish with these words from Habakkuk, this beautiful image. He says, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. Gee, thanks for that, Pastor. I feel like so much better now hearing about some deer. You know, what's he saying? Came across this picture. This is what he's talking about. You know, sometimes we feel like we're on that landscape and it's all downhill. And and we look down and, you know, if if we could get the picture like deeper, you know, a lot of you who suffer from vertigo would start feeling a bit sick. And that's where some of you are today. You're close to losing balance 
and falling. And God is the one who provides you with the sure-footedness of an ibex deer, where you can trust in difficult times to give you balance and agility and traction. And this is what I long for all of us today, that you would focus not on that complicated situation in front of you, but but you would have the sure-footedness of a deer that as you work for the peace and prosperity of our city, you would have agility. That as you wrestle with the injustice and brokenness in our city, you may may travel the heights, able to see God and his big plan. Even when it feels like you're slipping, may we trust in difficult times. I'd like to finish with a prayer. Found this prayer uh, written by Jill Briscoe that sums up my feelings today. Let's pray together. Give me hinds feet, Lord, like yours. You are the hind of the morning. Walk with me on the heights. Help me to jump, to leap over the crevices. You go first. Show me how it's done, Lord. Land me safely on sure ground. Give me a high view of Scripture, of the purposes and promises of God. Give me a vision from the heights of the whole panorama of your purposes. Preserve me from the mountain lion that would terrorize me. Give me fleet feet when the lion comes. And if he pants and brings me down, help me to bear it well. Meet me on the other side of sorrow in a new place, in a new race, in a new age, on a new page of eternal history. And until then, O heavenly hind of the morning, talk to me. And tell me often about the dawn of the new day. Oh, toughen me now tenderly and give give me hind's feet. Help me to trust you in difficult times. Help us to trust you in difficult times. In Jesus' name, amen.